Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and by popular demand, we are expanding the subject of murals throughout the entire summer. Yep, all summer long, you'll hear from master muralists to learn the tips to creating a thriving business painting large scale. I have handpicked each interviewee based on their expansive knowledge of the mural industry so that you can learn from the absolute best. Plus, I'm throwing in some of my own mural tips within solo episodes. And if that isn't enough, I've created a full training for you all about how to grow your art business quickly using murals like I have. If you're listening this summer and thinking, okay, let me see what this mural thing is all about. Or if you're wondering if you could even create large scale paintings too, then go to artistacademy.co to learn how you can start making money in the mural biz. (laughs) The majority of my income comes from murals and I want to help you get started too because I know how profitable they can be. (laughs) You'll go to artistacademy.co to claim your free training and I hope you're having a fabulous summer. (laughs) This week's episode features California-based muralist Jeff Rom. This might be one of my favorite episodes because Jeff has a lifetime of experience in the arts industries and he's just so willing to share everything. (laughs) We talk a lot about what can go wrong in the mural process, whether it's non-payment, miscommunication, customers using our designs but hiring other artists to complete them all those mural nightmares <laughs> but i want to remind you that for every 10 customers or so there's only one that isn't happy for some reason or another and that's just life <laughs> but the majority are just really positive experiences in today's episode we chat about the ways to reconcile these situations that might happen every so often and jeff shares so many stories and words of wisdom in this over an hour long chat. So grab a paintbrush, stay productive, and just listen to the mural stories in the background and let me know what you think about this week's episode with muralist Jeff Rom. Hello, (laughs) we are here with Jeff Rom and I am so excited that we made it work and we're coming at you on a holiday weekend, whatnot, or long weekend and Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? As I was telling you earlier, you came highly recommended in (laughs) the mural artist group that we're in on Facebook. And so I was like, I have got to interview this guy. We've got to make it work. So thank you so much for coming on and donating your time to us. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I've been an artist my whole life. So I've done a lot of different careers. When I first got out of college, my first job was doing medical illustration for a hospital. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. and worked in an ad agency there and did thrilling things like the life cycle of the bull weevil for the Department of Agriculture. I hated it. It was so boring. Had to wear a suit and tie. And it was awful. So anyway, one of my co-workers went to a party and met this vice president of this animation studio. And they said, if there's anyone that would like to work, have them stop by and bring their portfolio. So I took my portfolio to Broadcast Arts. And what they specialized in was 3D animation, like Tim Burton kind of stuff for commercials. And I loved it. And they interviewed me. And about a month later, they hired me to do some backdrops for a set, a miniature set of a Crest commercial. And so I would do my day job in my suit and go at night and work paint backdrops in my suit. And then they decided to move to New York because all their clients were in New York, all the advertising agencies were there. So I asked the freelance buyer person, Christine, I said, do you think you'll have enough work for me to come up? Because I wanted to be a book illustrator and all the publishers are in New York. So she said, sure, come on up. So I moved to New York with Broadcast Arts and I went to the different uh, publishers and they said the best way to get into book illustration is to illustrate a whole book and then try to sell it like an ABC book or a copyright free like Dickens or something. I was like, I, I don't have the time 
to illustrate a whole book and on the premise that maybe I'll get to sell it eventually. I need money now. I need to pay rent. So that didn't happen. That never happened. I was working, doing storyboard artist, character design, pretty much everything but the actual animation or these commercials, art direction. And we did the first season, you probably don't even know about because you're too young, Pee Wee's Playhouse, which was a Saturday morning show with Pee Wee Herman. And there was a guy making puppets, marionettes for the show, and he was doing makeup on Broadway. So I showed him a couple pictures of me dressed as different characters. Like I, my favorite role is Scrooge. I try to play Scrooge almost every year. And he said, you know what? We're going on national tour with Judd Hirsch and Cleavon Little with I'm Not Rappaport. You want to do the Broadway show while we're on tour? And I'm like, okay. So I started doing makeup on Broadway with Hal Linden and Ozzie Davis. And then it was just funny how New York was. I just want to, it's like, things everybody's on this island manhattan island and you just it's very easy to connect and network because you're constantly running into people i live in california now in los angeles we're all in our cars it's very insular but back then we didn't have internet we couldn't network and socialize on the internet so it was good to live in manhattan at the time it was my Facebook. And I was eating dinner one night at an Indian restaurant with a friend. And in walks this lady who was an instructor for a 3D makeup class I took, prosthetic class I took, Jennifer. I said, hey, Jennifer, I'm doing makeup on Broadway. She's like, that's great. And we exchanged business cards. So a year goes by and this lady asked me, do you know anyone who does makeup for a living? Because that's what I'm thinking of doing. I said, I know Jennifer, but let me call her first because I haven't uh, spoken to her in a year. I want to make sure the phone number is still good. So I called her and she said, Jeff, it's so funny you called. I was looking for your phone number yesterday and I couldn't find it. I've been offered to do Stephen Sondheim's new musical Into the Woods and I can't do it because I'm working for the New York Opera. You want to do it? So I was like, sure. So I got to do makeup for Into the Woods on Broadway and got to work with Bernadette Peters. And I did all the witches that came through, did their prosthetic makeup and the wolf for Little Red Wolf. And but that's how it was in New York. It was just one thing after another. And it was just things falling into place. And then after seven years, I got tired of New York. Into the Woods was about to close. They wanted me to do the makeup for Grand Hotel before it came to New York. It was still in Boston. I couldn't go that weekend. They wanted me up a particular week, so I couldn't do that. I thought, Into the Woods is closing. I really had enough of New York because the energy there is just crazy. They want everything done yesterday. And I said, I really want to get into special effects and the film industry. So I decided to move to LA. And then I interviewed with the studios and they have seen I've been an art director New York and they say you're not in the union you'll have to start all over again as an apprentice and get into the union and so they really basically tried to talk me out of even going that route which in the end I think is a good thing because CGI stuff came everything's created on computers now scenic art is really dying in the film industry because everything's done in computer now. If you compare Lord of the Rings, which was all real and miniatures, to the way they did The Hobbit, it was all green screen. So anyway, that's when I started my own business, paint murals. I did a little bit of it in New York. A friend of mine had an antique shop and I would paint bifold screen doors normally use them on the closet doors. I paint them as screens and sell them through her antique shop. And so I really liked creating art for art's sake, just to beautify, not to sell a product like in advertising and all that. So I started with my mural business and just moving to LA, I didn't know anybody. So I just went through the phone book back then. We still didn't have the internet yet. So I went through the phone book, the yellow pages, and just called interior designers and finally got one person to hire me, Ron Swing. 
And then I started doing showcase houses. I don't know. Do you know what showcase houses are? Or should I explain that? No, yeah. Okay. Showcase houses are when non-charitable organizations, they take a house, <coughs> they take a whole house and they have different designers do each room. And it's supposed to be the best and the most current and they show the latest things. And a lot of manufacturers will donate like kitchen people, kitchen appliance people will donate because to be in a showcase house, it gets a lot of exposure. It's published a lot. Like the, one of the largest in the country is here in California, the Pasadena showcase house. And it's one of the oldest. And then there's a big one in New York. And so they sell tickets, usually like the one in Pasadena, it's to raise money for the kids, for the orchestra, the children's orchestra, and to go to, to trips to go to the Philharmonic and all that. So anyway, people come in droves. The Pasadena one is really big. There's a lot of showcase houses around, but the Pasadena one is the one. And a lot of designers go to that one. So I did a couple of Pasadena showcase houses. And through that, I met a lot of designers and I got a lot of exposure. So during that time, almost all my work was through designers that I got from the Pasadena Showcase House. So if you can do a showcase house, it's really good exposure, particularly if you're starting out. It depends on the showcase house, how much exposure you get. Like I said, the Pasadena one is the best out here. I've done other ones where I didn't get any because designers don't go to them. Designers out here just go to Pasadena. They don't bother with the other ones. I made one person, you know, one residential person, but it it's good exposure. And also one good thing is that the rooms are all professionally photographed for the brochure, for the book that you get. So it's a nice way to get free professional photographs of your work. So I had these designers for years. And then the recession hit, so we're up to 2008 now, and 2007 was my best year ever. And I, you know, made six figures, which is not what I normally do. I made six figures in 2007, and then the recession hit in 2008, and my income went down by a third. All the designers I was working with were older. They all retired. Rather than fight the recession, they all just gave up and retired. So I lost all my referral work from designers and I had my second child at the time. And so I was recommended by a designer to replace her. She was quitting. She was teaching interior design at a community college. So I started teaching faux class and faux finishing and beginning interior design, the basic first class that all the students took in interior design. So I was as a sideline to supplement my, my income. And then that community theater closed down the entire interior design department. So I lost that job. But by then, the recession was easing up. The internet was there. So I had a website and I was getting a lot of work from my website. A lot of people would search muralist or whatever on their websites on the internet and find my website. And I just recently updated it because when I first made it, Tuscany was all the rage here in LA. Everybody was doing Tuscany. So I did my website to look Tuscan. And now everything's going very modern very a lot of grays silver very clean so when my second child was born i also started taking faux finish classes because before i had my second child i was a muralist and faux finishing was beneath me but with a second child i was like okay i gotta be able to do more stuff. I have to branch out. Murals is not enough. So I started doing faux finishing. And just recently, I added a whole bunch of faux finish samples that are all modern with mic and glitter and glass beads and all that bling that they like, the gray silver bling, which is really big in LA right now. 
So anyway, you got to keep up with the trends. When I first came to LA, it was all mauve. Everything was mauve with cherubs and mauve was all I did. And then it went into Tuscany and now it's into modern. But already I'm seeing the modern is already waning. People are already tired of gray, which I'm so glad I find gray so depressing. Who would want to live in a gray house? I know, me too. I love white though. I love the cleanness of white, but grays and I'm like, oh. Yeah. White to me, because I grew up in apartments. Whenever I see a white wall, I think in Navajo white or Swiss coffee, I think apartment. Why do you want your house to look like an apartment? <laughs> so I, to me, white walls is a blank canvas. You, know, oh, okay. it's like, you need something. Anyway, so now with the internet, I just found a group on, on Facebook uh, called Spanish Revival. And it's all people interested in Spanish revival architecture. And so I posted a bunch of pictures of stuff I did for Spanish revival style homes. And I just had an interview last Saturday. I just posted it two weeks ago. This is very recent. And I just had my first interview from my, that posting on Saturday where this woman wants me to paint with some beans and maybe it'll lead to other things. But I find about a third of my work comes from Facebook now. I had tried Thumbtack and Craigslist and all those things. And for me, I found most of them, I've been in the business long enough. I'm not, I'm not cheap. You know, I'm not the cheapest one out there. I have a family to support and all that. I have two kids and I can't compete with the ones who are doing it as a secondary income. I'm the primary breadwinner of my family. My wife is a school teacher, makes nothing. School teachers make nothing. And we have to correct that. But anyway, so I have to earn enough to support my family. So I can't compete with, I don't do nurseries. I don't do kids rooms rarely because I just can't, there's a lot of artists out there. That's their niche. And so it's like, fine. I could show you, I have a book here, but this is more the type of stuff I do. If you can see that. Oh, yes. So the beautiful, what style would you say that is? It's a, a ceiling mural, but. Classic. I would say that particular one, I would say is more like Baroque. But that's another thing here living in LA. I don't know where your group, they probably live all over America. Yeah. Yeah. I'd probably be much happier living on the East Coast. That's where I was born and raised. I was born in Baltimore. I was on the East Coast. And it's much more formal on the East Coast, a lot more English influence, European influence. Living in California, I go crazy because everything is rustic. Everything is shabby chic. And to me, it just looks shabby. <laughs> yeah. I like elegance. I like formal. I like damask. I'm constantly asked to make a room look derelict with exposed stone and cracks and all that. And I would love to make it look like the Sistine Chapel. So I'm not living in the right area. There's areas of LA that have that kind of elegance like Beverly Hills, but that's a very hard market to get into. And when I interviewed with designers in Beverly Hills, they say, I don't charge enough. Mm -hmm. Because in Beverly Hills, it's all about, oh, look how much money I spent on this. They brag about how much money they spent. And if you don't charge a lot, they think you mustn't be very good. You know, you pay for the quality. And, but the thing I found with Beverly Hills, and I hate to generalize, but I find with very wealthy people, they're not ethical. They don't pay. They're very stingy. They're very tight with their money. But there's a story where I interviewed with this guy. He wanted me to do incredible stuff like oh this is all portfolio stuff it'll look oh i can't wait but he said there's something about it. i have an intuition it's very good when i meet someone almost within three seconds i know whether this person's good or not and i've always learned i've learned to trust my intuition over my head my brain because it's always eventually proved to be true and this person i just had a bad feeling about and he said oh i have a contract that I have all my workers sign. I go, oh, never had a client ask me to sign a contract. Give it to me and I'll have my lawyer look over, you know, look it over and I'll, you know, I'll get back to you. And he never got back to me. He never sent me the contract because I went to him once, showed him my work and all that. And he showed me everything he wanted. Then he had me come back again and he, 
one of the things was a bedroom ceiling that was baroque with cartouches and doll- very, if Graham Rust, the British, the painted house, he did a couple of books, but very Graham Rust. And uh, someone had sketched out a whole side of this mural. And I'm like, and it was well done. And I was like, what happened to this artist? He started, where is he now? Yeah. So that was a big warning sign. Because if I go into a house and I interview with someone and they have beautiful work already done, I ask them what happened to the person. And they say, oh, they moved away or they retired. I was like, oh, okay. But if they don't have a, an answer, then it's maybe that artist didn't want to come back because they were so difficult to work with. But anyway, so I saw this and it was a big red flag. So nothing happened. About a year goes by, maybe not a year. And the secretary calls me and says, I have, my boss is looking for an artist to do this work. This in the dining room, this in the bedroom, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this sounds very familiar. I think I've already interviewed with your boss about a year ago. And something told me not to work with him. And she said, I shouldn't be telling you this but I'm quitting in a week. Trust your instincts. Don't work for him. And I was like, okay. And I was starting to say, oh, but it would be great for my portfolio. She said, no, don't work for him. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And I have a feeling that in that contract, it said somewhere that something like, if I'm not 100% satisfied, I don't need to pay you. And the second time I went to the house, I saw him up on the left. I had caught him. He was up on a ladder checking the tops of the doors, making sure the house painters had painted the tops of the doors. So I think this guy was just, he was rich for, what's the word? Uh, Just not taking advantage of people and not paying. Like another famous person I can think of who is notorious for not paying his contractors. But yeah, so you meet all kinds and it's, at this stage in my life, to me, it's more important. The client, the niceness, the atmosphere I'm working in is more important than actually what I'm doing. I have one client who's my fa- one of my favorite clients. I think of him more as a friend than a client. He's a movie producer, David Kirshner. He did the Chucky movies and Hocus Pocus and Five All, the American Tale, Animated Mouse. And he's just the nicest man. But I never got to paint a mural for him because he already has an incredible art collection. His walls are covered with art. So I ended up doing some of his ceilings. But he's just the nicest guy. And I just look forward. Oh, you have a one-day job for me? Great. I'd love to see you and Liz and hang out with you too. And once I did a ceiling for him, and he, I, it was a coffered ceiling. So I said, I'll do it on panels, and then we'll just apply it between the beams. And he said, no, Jeff, I really rather, I know the scaffolding will be up for days and all that, and it'll be more of an inconvenience for me, but I'd rather have you here because I like your company. So, you know, that, and I was, it was great. Whenever I go and work for him, I feel like it's a vacation because they have a beautiful home and it overlooks their back overlooks a national park so it's just beautiful surroundings and they always brings me plate of fruit and cookies and drink and anything i feel like i have a servant a butler while i'm working there but just the nicest guy and then i've done some incredible like one of my favorite houses that i worked in and I, a bunch of them a bunch of those projects are in this book i almost could do a whole like here that's the breakfast room ceiling and oh, and this is David Kirshner's dining room ceiling. That's amazing. I love that. How did, is that all hand painted or did you use any kind of? Well, okay, let me talk about, let me talk about some of my techniques. This, everything is painted directly on the ceiling and I use stencils to do all the vine work, all the vines. If I have to do vines, I use stencils to lay out the shapes. And then I go back with hand painting to add the shading and highlights to make it look hand painted. But all the flowers and the birds, I painted on cambric cloth, which is a very thin material they use to make cheap roller blinds. I painted them at home in the studio 
and then I just applied them to the ceiling. So I didn't have to paint the birds and flowers upside down, looking up at the ceiling. I could paint them comfortably at my desk. Oh, that's so nice. How, what kind of material did you use? And then how did you stick it to the ceiling? I've yet okay, to do it's an installation now. Cambric cloth. It's C A M B R I C cloth. Okay. And it's a uh, vinyl impregnated fabric. It's again, it's like what they use to make those really cheap roller blinds. And let's see, there's a company, Virginia, I think, Virginia Coated Fabrics. If you post it, I'll put links to where I, the manufacturers. Okay, um, that'd be awesome. Some of them went out of business fairly recently. There was C-Moore, C-M-O-R. I think they're the ones that went out of business though. But, and then you can just use, you can use glue or I use a uh, wallpaper border adhesive. Border adhesive is has more tack to it than regular wallpaper paste. So I use wallpaper border adhesive and I just stick them up. That's for interiors. Now, if I'm doing an exterior job, I use, what's it called? Oh, I've gone blank. I'll, again, I'll. I've I'll heard something links. called like poly. Poly tab. Poly, uh, poly okay. tab, I think it is. But it's very, thin. it's like extremely thin felt. It's a non-woven material and you have to put very slick plastic behind it because the paint seeps right through it. And if you put something that doesn't release easily, it'll stick to whatever you have behind it. So I learned that the, I, I used a tarp once and it stuck to the tarp. So I have to use plastic garbage bags. They're slick enough that the paint will stick to it. But so you, when you're finished painting, it's almost completely 100% acrylic paint. And I use for exterior jobs, and I, I'm, most of you probably are aware of this, Nova Color. Nova Color paint is really great for exterior. It's very reasonably priced. Different colors cost different amounts because depending on how much it costs to make, it, they pass on that savings to you. If it's a cheaper paint to make, they sell it for less money. But, and they have a lot of information for exterior murals, light fastness rating number one, all that kind of stuff. You, and they give you the palette. These are the colors we recommend if you're doing an exterior mural and no other. Don't use the other ones because they'll eventually fade. And then if I'm doing an exterior, they have a, a gel, uh, an acrylic gel that I use as adhesive. If you lived in LA, you go downtown LA, there's these Kent Titchwell, who is a very well-known muralist here in LA. He's semi-retired now, but he did murals that are several stories high going up the sides of skyscrapers in downtown LA. And they've been there for years, decades, and they still look fresh. And that's the same exact technique that he used because I actually friended him on Facebook and asked him exactly what he used. So I'm using the same exact techniques that he used. Nothing as big as his though. He, he used gigantic murals, uh, 50 foot tall figures. But anyway, so that's the techniques I used. Anything repetitive. Oh, and that's another thing too that really helped my business that I didn't mention was I joined an organization back then. It was called Sally, Stencil Artisans League Incorporated. And because that made me aware of all the different stencil companies and they had conventions and I would go to the conventions and then I would teach at the conventions. And I think that's why a lot of your know me is probably through all the, those conventions I did. And I, for a while there, they have different chapters. They would fly me out to different cities for the weekend and paint and do a mural painting class for the weekend which was really nice because you got to meet people and they treat you like a star, you know, <laughs> like you're something special and uh, really nice. It was, I met a, made a lot of friends that way that I still keep in touch with. And they're now called Adele, and I can't remember, International Decorative Artist League. And now their focus is not on stenciling, it's more on faux finishing and plasters and again, keeping up with the trends because for a while there, stenciling was really popular. There were big stencil companies. I got went on the Christopher Lowell show, which was a show on the Discovery Channel. 
And that was cool. I did six episodes on national television. And I'd walk down the street and occasionally someone would say, are you, I've seen you. And I was like, yeah, you saw the Christopher Lowell show. Yeah, yeah. That was kind of, I had some minor fame there doing his show. But then the stenciling business dried up and they all, a lot of them went out of business. I had my own stencil company, Jeff Ron Stencils. And I had a lot of cherubs because that was big at the time. And, um, but I never really branched out. I never offered enough to really make it uh, worthwhile. So I sold all my designs to designer stencils and they now carry my stencils and they just give me a residual. They just, you know, I get a percentage every time they sell one of my things. But yeah, so I've tried a little bit of everything to make ends meet and keeping up with the trends. When the stencil business went out, I had to do something else. When murals, Tuscany murals went out, I had to do something else. I just took a class on liquid metal to learn how to use liquid metal and change any surface into metal. So it's constantly having to reinvent myself. Somebody commented just a second ago and said they, they used to watch that show and that their mom has your stencils. So oh, they wow, know exactly cool. who you are. <laughs> cool. I love that people bought my stencils, but I never saw what they did with them. I would say like he sold stencils for years and maybe only three people total ever sent me a picture and said, this is what I did. And I was like, yeah, I even have a Facebook page, Jeff Rom stencils, but no one posted pictures of what they did with my stencils. So I'd like to see what people did with them. Hint, hint. That's awesome. You have had just such an amazing career. I just could listen to you tell stories about murals and just all the different things that you've done, just from starting from doing special effects, makeup type stuff to like yeah. all everything. <laughs> it's, it's so yeah, cool. I have so many stories about Broadway and working with Bernadette Peters, singing music of the night with her in her dressing room, things like that, you know, and, and just Joanna Gleason as the baker's wife and just love some lovely people that I've met in Broadway and some not so nice people, but most of them are very nice. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, most people are very nice. I've come to find out too, even customers. And it's, we had a couple comments on here. There's a, a couple members here from LA and they commented several times. They're like, so many rich people asked me to show them uh, how to start a mural so that they can have, so they can finish it or have someone else finish it. Oh, I just had that happen to me. What? I've never heard of that. Please Yeah, tell. just last year I did last year, like I mentioned, 2020 was my best year ever. I didn't, I didn't mention that. But 2020 ended up being my best year ever. It even surpassed 2007. That's amazing. Because I, I got love to hear my, that. Yeah, I got my biggest residential job, which was doing an entire dining room uh, to look like you're sitting on a patio in Tuscany with the sky above and beams and grapevines hanging down. And I didn't even meet the clients. I met the assistant. And I said, I saw the house, which used to belong to Mel Gibson. And I said, I have no idea what their budget is or anything. So I'll just give you several proposals like sky's the limit, this, that, that. So I gave them all these different options. And they said, we'll go with the sky's the limit. And I'm like, great. <laughs> wow. Okay. So yeah, nice people, except I think because it was COVID, we all kept our distance. I was working in the house with masks on and stuff. So I think they're nice people. <laughs> uh, but, uh, anyway, yeah, I just, and then my largest commercial job was for Hollywood Forever Cemetery. I'm calling them out. This is what you did. I did a dome for their funeral home. It was really in bad shape. And I did this dome and I used the, since it was an exterior mural, and it was a dome, and I thought it's going to be really difficult to paint, like me leaning over a dome. So I painted it all on panels, the uh, polyvine or poly tab, whatever, poly tab. And I did it in sections. Like last year, I had such a workload, I ended up hiring eight assistants just to handle the workload. Normally, I work alone. And last year, I had a crew of eight. And we were all making these. Uh, I don't have a picture of it. But anyway, it's sort of Indian inspired. It's a gold dome with peacocks and Indian medallions. And anyway, I designed it so that we could do it in sections and then finally have this 
divided up into eight sections had this border going down to hide the seams. Everything was designed to sort of hide seams. You see it from such a distance anyway, it probably wouldn't have mattered. But anyway, I did it. They loved it. And they were like, oh, we love it so much. We want you to do the walls now. So I painted the wall. I didn't paint the walls. I designed the walls, did a mock-up of it. And they came back and said, we can't afford that. They didn't approve the bid and said, uh, can you do it for thousands less? I can't remember how many thousands less. And I was like, actually, I have seven jobs lined up right now that are ready to go. So maybe after those seven jobs are done, you'll have the money. And I left it at that because I thought they're in no rush. They've been wanting to do this dome for years. So I thought there's no pressure to get it done right now. Anyway, I found out, luckily, one of the assistants lived fairly close to the place. They stopped by and took a picture and the walls were done. And I was like, what happened? I didn't paint them. So they had taken my sketch and given it to a cheaper artist. And it was a rough mock-up. It didn't have any of the detail that I was planning on putting into it. And they matched the mock-up. And it, it's terrible. It's terrible. It, the colors don't match the dome. It was all supposed to match. There were the columns that were supposed to be gold and they just painted them yellow. There's no shading in the flowers or any of the. It's just really poorly done. And I said, you know, I was shocked and I emailed them and said, I'm disappointed that you went behind my back and hired another artist to execute my design, which was just a mock-up. And I said, this is nowhere near the level of what I was going to do. You saw the mock-up I did for the dome, compare that mock-up to the finished dome and see how much better it looks. The walls look as good maybe as my mock-up, if not as good as my mock-up. But anyway, so I sent them an invoice for my design work and they paid me right away. No. You know, they put the check in the mail the next day. So at least I got paid for my design work. But I thought, what, is, what a sneaky thing to do. Why didn't you tell me you wanted to have it done? And like I told him to take down the scaffolding. As far as I was concerned, the scaffolding was in the way for the walls because the walls weren't that high. I could e do it more easily with ladders and scaffolding. And I thought that was odd that the scaffolding was staying up and staying up and staying up. But anyway, so I don't know why they felt they had to do the walls right away. I said, well, if you didn't have the money, and then they told me we needed money for a new crematorium. I was like, why didn't you tell me? Just communicate with me. We could have, I could have just done like maybe the borders or just the panels or just the columns. We could have broke it down into sections and done phase one, phase two, phase three kind of thing. If you didn't have all the money up front, you know. Um, it's like we win battles we lose battles just communicate and talk to me and we can work something out yeah that's so true because that's really is the basis anytime i've had a misunderstanding with a client it could have all been talked out usually it's just they think you're thinking one thing it's a, a lot of assumptions and nobody says mm. anything and i was mm. gonna ask how you would reconcile that but you sending money for the mock-up i was like oh okay that that sounds yeah i mean they fair. pay me for the work i did and I said, I hope they use the right materials. Like I used the polyvine, which one reason was because of the dome itself, but also because it was very rough stucco. And gold paint on rough stucco would look terrible. It would just make it look even rougher. It would just accentuate the texture. So the polyvine helped to hide that texture big time because we put the gel on, the adhesive on really thick on both surfaces and almost like filling the valleys of the stucco as we're applying these pieces. And this artist, he painted right on the rough stucco. So they had that rough texture. It, it's gonna look completely different than the dome because of that rough texture. And then I don't know if they used proper exterior grade paint that will last. I put coats, like I use Modern Masters exterior uh, grade, uh, varnish they have because it comes in dead flat i use their dead flat varnish for all my exterior stuff and except for the dome 
because they wanted a gloss. They wanted it shiny. So I used their high gloss exterior varnish, but I use Modern Masters. So I don't know if they protected it with a varnish or what. So it'll be interesting to see as the years progress how my dome holds up compared to the walls. Because I said to them, you may end up having to hire someone again. That money you saved up front is going to get lost when you're having to repaint it because it faded like your the dome originally was. The dome originally was painted black and gold, and it looked terrible. It didn't last five years because I just didn't use the right paint. And so I said, you're going to have that problem again. Yeah, and you you really do get what you pay for with things like mm -hmm. this. And yeah. you, I'm and I'm like smiling ear to ear because I'm like I use the modern masters. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have a comment in here. Is there a way uh, for Artist Academy to get just like a quick list of some of the materials that you had mentioned? I know that so many people, there's a, especially a couple members in here, are venturing into doing install murals. And um, or just at least a couple of the materials you've used for that, or uh, well, like I can paints. just go on your Facebook page, the okay. Academy page, and just do a post and list that, things. That yeah, would I be amazing. Do. Thank you so no much. No problem. Uh, you'll get my bill in the mail. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> invoice me. <laughs> I'll invoice you. <laughs> for my years of experience exactly <laughs> we all uh, so appreciate you coming on here and just sharing all of this we could we had somebody comment here a second ago i was like Lo love hearing your stories jess thank you like they're just keep telling stories <laughs> i could just go on and i'm old enough now i've got a lot of stories to give <laughs> I, I remember back when you, yeah, man. but anyway, yeah, I'm a ham. I, theater is my hobby. I love acting. What was I going to say? I was going to say something. Is that better. Scrooge that you were doing? Or is that... Oh, no, Scrooge is this. <laughs> if I could work my will, every idiot who goes about the Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Yeah, that's Scrooge. I love that. I can, I was going to say, yeah, if you want to see my work, jeffrom.com, J-E-F-F-R-A-U-M.com. It's, I've updated the website, but I haven't really updated the content yet. And it even has my theater stuff on there. You can see the Broadway makeup. You can see me as Scrooge, all that. But yeah, everything's on jeffrom.com. And then I have my Facebook page is Jeff Rom Studio, Studios, and then well, Jeff Rom, and then uh, Instagram. Although I'm not really into Instagram, but um, I post occasionally. And I like. I I'm you. a fan of Facebook. I'm yeah, Facebook. we can see you hanging out in the mural artist group that we met in. <laughs> yeah, and all of that. Okay, I have one last question for you before I let you go. So, okay. there's a lot of artists in here and beginner muralists, and they see artists like you, and they're like, oh, "I want to be like that someday." What is some advice that you would give to artists nowadays to get started in their mural career? What's like the oh, start? God, you've got it so easy now, guys. <laughs> You have internet. Yeah. <laughs> you have, imagine back in the day when we didn't have internet, how you had to go out and knock on doors and call people, cold calling. Oh, one thing though that I need to do, and I didn't mention before the recession hit, do direct mailers. I had a friend of mine design a threefold flyer, and I would, I, joined, I, I hired one of these label companies where they actually make you labels and you can just stick the label on an envelope and mail it out with all these people who just bought homes. It was homeowners, some kind of homeowners thing. But anyway, you can determine what zip codes you want to mail to, the cost of the homes, the, 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 the you know, high-end homes. And so you can really pinpoint these people just bought a new house. They're going to want to decorate. And it was great. Before the recession hit, that was my number one way of getting work. First starting out, it was designer. Then finding about these direct mailers. And I'm thinking of doing it again now because I stopped after the recession hit because I got nothing when the recession hit. Um, just doing postcards, which would be a little cheaper but just making them aware. I'll have to redesign it because it's all Tuscany, my old 
flyer. So I'll have to update it, make it look something that puts some contemporary stuff in there. But that was great. And I would put a, what was it? Four to six week delay. I asked the label company to mail me labels that escrow had closed a month ago or six weeks ago, because people, when they just close escrow, they're not ready to think about deck painting their wall. That's something like down after they settled in a little bit. It took me a while to figure out exactly how many weeks to delay it. It might have been more than six weeks because you don't want to delay it too much because if they're already thinking about it, they might have found someone else. But I got a lot of work. So direct mailers worked great for me, getting those labels, picking out which zip codes I wanted to work in and the value of the home. That really helped. And then just have a really great website on Facebook. Yeah, I don't work that much with designers now. Every state is different. California, and I taught this in my interior design class, California is what is called a self-certification state, which means basically you can go to the printer, print up business cards and call yourself an interior designer without any formal education. And so every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there, or Harriet, Maud, and Joan out there, they can call themselves interior designers, and they don't know what the hell they're doing. I get so frustrated working with designers because a lot of them, they just, I know more than they do, and I have to teach them. But there's some, like I was born in Maryland, you have to take all kinds of classes and get all kinds of certification to call yourself an interior designer. It's one of the tougher states in the whole country to, to get that uh, certification. So it depends on the state you live in. But if you have a, a state that has requirements, then yeah, look out, look for interior design. I still try to find interior designers. They don't really give me that much work anymore. I have one interior designer. She loves me. And we love working together, Mariah, but she, she, a lot of her clients now just want white walls. They don't want decorative painting. They just, it's very clean. And I just did one house with her that was great. And it's on my web, it's on my uh, Facebook page, Spanish revival style. And it was great because um, we got to do some really cool stuff. But uh, most of her houses are very clean. And she says, I love to use you, Jeff. It's just my clients don't want decorative painting. So um, I'm hoping that decorative painting is not on its way out. I'm doing more and more commercial murals, less residential. I'm finding I'm doing more and more commercial. And there's always room for commercial murals. I don't know personally how to get into that, really. I know one woman, Hat Hatteras. Hatteras, I've, done, I've worked with her as an assistant. She had his, had his public murals. That's all she does is public, pretty much public murals. She's busy. She's swamped. She's looking for assistance. She's hiring people. I don't know what she does. I don't know how she networks. I, but I've seen her. She has a folder and I think she just mails out to companies, but direct mailers I find do work. And then also having a good website because a lot of people find me on the internet. And then a third of my work is through Facebook networking. I've hired all my assistants that I've used, I've hired through Facebook. I've seen their work, post it, and I go, okay, that person, like the dining room, that person can do stone. So he's going to do the low stone surround in my dining room because I know he can do stone. And it's like you have your portfolio right there for everyone to see. But yeah, the internet, it's so easy nowadays compared to when I started out. Oh, it's so easy. And I, I love that you said that too, because that's kind of how I think of it too. We take five, 10 minutes to post a photo and it reaches so many people and, and there's still people out there complaining that they don't want to post. I'm like, it's so easy though. I don't understand why people don't have a professional page like Jeff Rom Studios. I have, I, I often forget to post stuff on it because I post everything on Jeff Rom. And you can friend me if you want, just Jeff Rom, because okay. <laughs> you can see everything there, because I post everything on Jeff Rom, even my model painting where I'm painting monsters and stuff. But yeah, I, I have some designers that I know that don't have a page. And I'm like, why not? 
<laughs> Why don't you have a page? And some of my old interior designers that retired, yeah, they had no tech savvy. They didn't know how to use the internet or anything. It was all word of mouth. They had been in the business so long that it worked for them. But now I don't get word of mouth. I don't get referrals. People say, oh, you must get a lot of referrals. No, I don't. A lot of my clients want to keep keep me for them. Like I'm their artist. They don't share information. Or someone sees the work and goes, oh, remember so-and-so had that beautiful mural in their house. Let's just, they don't care to think, let's hire that artist. They just think of hiring an artist like a plumber. You know, <laughs> that drives me crazy. It's like, I've had designers. I walked into this one Gladman's, which is very high-end furniture store. And I said, I'm a decorative painter. Would you like to see my portfolio? Oh, we have a decorative painter. I'm like, oh, what kind of murals does he do? Oh, he doesn't do murals. He's a Venetian plaster. I was like, I don't do Venetian plaster. I'm a, I do murals. To say that you have a decorative artist, it's like saying, I only use Michelangelo. I only use Cezanne. I only use Monet. I only use Picasso in my framed art. It's like art. every artist is different and every artist will do the job differently. And to say that we, and I've had designers say, I have a decorative artist. I was like, well, so you, who do you use for all your canvas, your, your framed art? You only have one artist for that? And it just drives me crazy to have that kind of mentality if we're a plumber or something. All plumbers are the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a pet peeve of mine. You just got me <laughs> standing on my soapbox there for a minute. Artists are all different and we support each other. I can't stand when I come across an artist that's, oh, I don't share my trade secrets. Anyone's success is our success. Anyone's failure is our failure. It has a reflection on the whole business. It really upset me. Like one showcase house I went to in Lake Sherwood, which is a very exclusive gated community near where I live. I don't live there. It's near where I live. Every room had decorative painting in it and every room sucked. It was awful. I was furious. I was like, designers are hiring these people, putting them in a showcase house, not even hiring because it's volunteer it's all free for the exposure kind of thing but i was like this is such bad advertising for our business people are going to say i don't want a mural did you see that awful mural that person had and i'm surprised these designers couldn't tell the difference they were willing to have this awful work in their house and i worked in i just did a back staircase i did a trump loy hot iron railing to match the real railing on the grand staircase. And I did a damask. And then there were words over it that had to do with fashion because it came right off the walk-in closet upstairs for the master bedroom down directly to the kitchen. It was just this little tiny space. But I got work from that because people could see the quality of my work. I got one of my best designers at that time from that little hallway. It didn't really show what I could do, but my work, frankly, it, my work stood out in that showcase house because the rest of it was so god awful. It was just, oh, it was embarrassing. And that's what I talk about California being a self certification state. There are people out there calling themselves interior designers that really don't know what the hell they're doing. And they're not decorators, they're not designers, they're decorators. The difference, right? You know, interior designers. They can move walls. They can do architectural changes. Does decorators come in and just make the walls pretty? They just make the room pretty, but they can't do structural work. So that's another thing. A lot of interior designers, so-called, that I've met aren't designers at all. They're just decorators. You are inspiring me to maybe try to take like an interior design class because it is all one with another. And just to know a little bit about that, it's you can better advise. I could better advise of what yeah. to do. Because a lot of times I'm doing a mural and they're like, what do you think about this over here? And I'm like, uh, I wish I could. You got to be careful though. <laughs> Tell you another story. I had an interview with, oh, what's his name? Can't remember his name. He's an angel. He played angel, the vampire. Is an actor. He was in Bones. Probably someone that's listening knows the. Anyway, I went to his house and they wanted me to do this groin ceiling in their entry. 
And the designer, she brought four boards of color to stick up on the wall for them to decide what color to paint the dining room. And the client, the, the actor's wife said, oh, I like this color, but I like it lighter. She didn't bring a fan deck of paint. I had a fan deck. I said, oh, you want that lighter? Okay, so I just brought out my fan deck and I matched the color that was there. And I said, that lighter color than that is this. And she went, oh, you're very helpful. The wife didn't like it that I stepped in and just sort of took over kind of thing that I had a fan deck that the designer should have brought. And she's, she actually asked her husband to take me to another room while she talked to the designer because I was just the artist. I shouldn't be inputting other things, you know. Was, oh my gosh. I didn't get the job. I'm I getting get a job. lot of stories from you that are a lot of with different attitudes in yeah. California and because in Missouri, you don't really get that a whole lot. There's a couple. And actually, I just had a recent communication thing and I just did two paintings for a couple who was from California and it was kind of weird like that. And I'm just <laughs> like, I don't want to stereotype. I just, I don't want to do it. But, but you can. Like, Californians yeah. can have attitude. They're like, mm. You know, they think no, Nouveau Reach. There's there's an area near me, Westlake Village. Beautiful mansions, beautiful homes. Nouveau Riche. They have no taste. They have money. They have no taste. And then you go to places like Beverly Hills. They have money, but they got it. A lot of them got it by being unethical. And then you have Calabasas, which is a nice area. Malibu is a nice area, but you get all types. You get all types. There's general, he's made up of a lot of different areas. There's certain areas I really, I hear the address and go, oh, okay, I got to be careful in this neighborhood or in this neighborhood, it's okay. Like my favorite client, David Kirshner, he's in Calabasas, nice people, but you get all types. You get all types. A lot of the, and then I get some people that just really don't have the money. This is a big splurge for them. This is a big deal for them. Oh, and they'll just be so appreciative. Or I have a saying, the smaller the job, the bigger the headache. Where I get this little job that's maybe half a day, not even a full day's worth of work. They want to have four uh, consultations about it. We'll talk, they want to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and just go on and on. To me, it's nothing. To me, it's, oh, I can do this in my sleep. To them, it's, oh, they've never done anything like it. And so after a while, I have to say, oh, if you want another consultation, you'll have, you know, I, my first consultation is free. But if they keep wanting to come back and talk about it some more, it's $50 a consultation. I just had, when I went to this woman that from Facebook, from the Spanish revival thing, she just offered, she said, here's $100 because you came out here and I feel like I'm asking you for design work and design consultation. So I, I want to pay you for your time and your advice. And I was like, that was a first. In 33 years, I never had anyone volunteer to pay me for a consultation and $100 at that. I was like, wow, sure. I said, she said, is that enough? Is that okay? I was like, no, that's more than, no, really. But again, it's a little job, but the people are so nice. And so to me at this stage in my life, I'm too old to have to, and I've been around the block too long to have to deal with difficult people. It's, it's not worth my time. You're, that is so true. As you saying the smaller the job, the bigger, bigger the headache. I am just one of the smallest jobs that I have done this year so far. I'm having the most trouble with even collecting payment afterward. And I'm just like, oh, this, I'm like, I've even partially been like, I could, just, it's so small that I'm like, maybe I'll just forget it. I'm like, no, like, it's just, <laughs> like, it's so true. I had one guy who still owes me $1,200. I painted a ceiling with a tinted look with a fancy border and everything. And he, he, I think he might be bipolar or schizophrenic, really, because it was like working with two different people. He'd be really nice one day and really awful. And then one day I was working with him and I heard him talk to his wife so disrespectfully. I felt sorry for her. I thought, how dare you talk to your wife like that? But yeah, he still owes me $1,200. and. About two, three years later, he ended up hiring a designer I know, 
And the designer walked into the bathroom where I did the ceiling and she looked up and said, oh, did Jeff Rom do this ceiling? And he said, yeah, how did you know? It's the only artist I know who does this quality. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I have other work for him. I'd like him to come back. I do owe him some money, though. Ha, 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 ha. And so I went and interviewed with him, and we had some other work for me. And I gave him the bids and said, these are the bids, and I'm willing to work with you again when you pay me the $1,200 you owe me. He didn't want to work with me. Like he thought I would just forget about the $1,200, even though he knew I he owed it. It was just weird. It's like the gall, the audacity to have someone come back to your house and you owe them money and expect still not to pay them. And he's still enjoying that ceiling and getting compliments on it. And I was just, wow, amazing people, all different kinds. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. all, all different kinds. But you telling all of these stories, and there's good and there's bad stories. It just, yeah, unfortunately, we tend to focus on the bad. I know, I, mean, I know. You know <laughs> but anyway. but I, I assume that like 80, 90% of your jobs are good, right? And 98. No, I would 98. say 98. Okay. Percent. That's exactly what I think too with mine. And yeah, so just, just, I don't even have contracts. I hear on look on Facebook, I look on these things, and it's all well, the contracts and all that. It's like with me, it's a it's just mutual trust. You're a nice person. I'm a nice person. And we're going to be adult about this. And we're going to do this job. And 98% of the time, they're, well, maybe 92% of the time, they're very appreciative. <laughs> and there's a few that aren't difficult to work with, but they're just, they don't show much emotion or <laughs> appreciation. They just yeah. pay me and it's a job. But yeah, most people are good people. And yeah. again, I trust my intuition. Even if they call, I usually can even tell on the phone if these people are going to be difficult or not. And unfortunately, I do stereotype. I, after so many years of being in the business, there's certain people, I don't even want to say it because I don't want to come across no, as racist or anything. Don't, don't. <laughs> but if I know they're this nationality, well, I know I'm not going to have to please only them. I'm going to have to please the whole family. Oh. Or they're going to barter with me. They're going to want a nickel and dime me. So I bid a little higher to compensate for them bartering, that kind of thing. Or there's some that just, there's no pleasing them. They're, they're extremely picky and extremely cheap. And it's hard to, you can't be both. But yeah, most people are really easy to work with. I think this is just such a good reminder, though, that it's not all sunshine and rainbows getting into this industry. You are going to have to deal with some people like that and stick up for yourself and then communicate really well. So even though we are focusing a lot on like maybe things that didn't go wrong, that is a small percentage, but it's just a really good reminder to people when they come across that to be like, Jeff has gone through it. I've gone through it. We've all yeah. had those customers. And it's well, the okay. thing is that is to be professional up front. They'll respect you. If you have an appointment, be on time. Don't be late. Be early. Wait in your car and wait until the actual... I happen to be very punctual. And I've had so many clients just comment on that one thing, even before we've said anything, even before maybe they've even seen my work. Some of them just call me even without even bothering to look at my website, which... Again, it's like hiring a plumber. Oh, here's an artist. He's, look at my website. Look at my work. But anyway, even before uttering a word, just being on time. That's, wow, this person's professional. He's a businessman, too. He's not just a flighty. I've heard horror stories of people smoking pot on the job and things like that. Really? And they're still employed? They're still working? And then I'll come you know, for the interview. I come in my clean clothes. I come nicely dressed. I don't come in paint. And people will say, oh, you don't look like an artist. I'm like, I'm not painting now. I don't always wear my paint clothes. And I even had people say, oh, when I didn't have a beard, they say, oh, you don't look like an artist. With a beard, they think I look like an artist. Without the beard, no, I don't look like an artist. That's like funny. And so even before you step through the door, or into the house, they've already made all these judgments about you. So be punctual and be reliable. Work well, work hard. If you play music, ask for permission, see if they mind or whatever. Just 
and clean up after yourself at the end of the day or ask them, is there a sink I can use? Is there a bathroom I can use? Is it okay for me? Don't just assume, just show courtesy. It's like, I was born on the East Coast and I just find, again, generalizing, we were taught manners. California, they're very laid back here. I just now, I'm very prim and proper. I've had some people even think I'm British because I have manners. And I'm like, no, I just was taught manners. But no, I'm not British. You're not from around here, are you? Yeah, I, I'm a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court kind of thing. I don't think I'll ever feel at home in California. I really don't. I don't think I'll ever fit in here, really. Yeah. But, you uh, sound just, my husband has this very generalized idea of California because we're, we're here in the Midwest and everybody right. has manners. Everybody is just, and he went out there to visit a couple of times. He's I can't do this. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> sorry for anybody listening from California. <laughs> just, he will go on rants about, because he, he's had a lot of bad experiences with either people or companies that are based out there. And he's just, it's just a different way of living. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very laid back here, which is nice, which is what I wanted out of New York. New York was just too much. It was too much. But yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's very <laughs> laid back. You know, my mom comes here from Maryland. She says, I feel like I'm in a different country. She, you know, from Maryland, you know, it's, it's completely different. <laughs> but, yeah. That's awesome. I've so enjoyed hearing all of your stories and just all of the advice and stuff. You can just tell that you're just a very genuine person too, just talking and you've shared so much and we just so Sometimes I'm too you. open. Sometimes I'm too genuine. I get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there's such a thing as too genuine, oh, you know. <laughs> with a client, it can be. Oh, like okay. that, that actor's wife. She didn't like oh. me being so open. And some of them just want you to say yes to mm -hmm. whatever they say, go, oh yes. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear, maybe we could do this, or maybe or if you think it's a little tacky or kitsch, or maybe not really the best idea for their house, some clients don't want to hear. They just want you to do what they want and that's it. So you gotta be you gotta be a chameleon. If you're just getting into this business and you're working with the public, you have to sort of be a chameleon. And if they're open and very gregarious and very you gotta be open and gregarious. If they're very formal and very you're the artist, I'm the client, I'm the one that's going to pay you, you're my servant, my slave. You've got to be aware of that. And I even sometimes dress. If I've been to a client, I just take a note of what they're wearing, what colors they like. I'll wear the same colors. I'll wear colors they like. I wear colors that go with their house so I don't clash with the house. Just subtle things. And these things I've also picked up working with interior designers. I had one designer that told me that. I'll see how much jewelry she was a woman, I'll see how much jewelry my client wears, and I will wear the same amount of jewelry. If she likes a lot of bling and big, chunky stuff, I'll wear big, chunky, blingy stuff. Okay, because particularly with designers, which are, you really work so closely with the client for a long time, you've got to morph into their best friend. And so even as an artist, you have to sort of morph yourself into being someone that, that the client will say, I could hang out with this person. This could be a friend of mine. This is someone I could work with. So again, that's something else. I keep thinking of things. You say something and I think, oh, this. To give advice to people, I've been in the business just doing murals and interior decoration and interior. 33 years, I've picked up on a lot of stuff and I've taken it for granted now. But thinking now, if you're brand new, just stepping into it, you, you know, this might all be news to you. It's something you haven't thought about. But anyway. Yeah, that's so true. And as you're doing that, or as you're talking, saying that, I'm like, man, I didn't even realize, but I do that too sometimes. There's one client who I go to, and every couple of months I'll go paint in his house, and he's very successful. And he just wants to tell me about all the successful things that he's done. And I'm like, tell me more. Tell me all the things. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> like, And so I'm all, I just go over there as like a... I am here to serve you. Thank you for paying me. Tell me how about your successes. And then I leave. And I'm just, I just kind of am a community. He doesn't want to know about mine, really. <laughs> he just, that's just the way it is. <laughs> that's one thing I have to work on because I'm, the, I like, I love my art. I love, my work is my play. 
And when I get to someone's house, I just want to get to there and start painting and let's go. And they like want to tell me about their relatives or what they have planned down the road. I'm like, I just want to paint. Oh, I charge I'm not them. good at just <laughs> hanging around and chit chatting. Oh, I'm charging for I that. I actually, <laughs> women in general are much better at just chit chat. I'm not big on chit chat. Uh, I want to get to work. And uh, some of them appreciate that, that. And I work hard. I, when I go, I don't take long lunches. I work eight hours a day. And I, and they respect that. They respect that he's a hard worker. He's not here lounging in my house. I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. I think that's a great wrap up for our whole interview. There's so many just different stories. I think yeah, so we many can go people. on part two, part yeah. six, Actually, part Actually, I would love that. Since we got just a great overview of your, of your career, I might hit you up here in a few months or whatnot, just to like, maybe have you come back on and we'll talk about maybe a specific thing in murals. Or yeah, and have something. a picture or have the image or something, because it's hard to talk about projects and Art. not have the picture. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's why I like Facebook. You post a picture. Yeah. It's like a picture book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love that. Thank okay, you again great. so much. I hope you have a great rest of your thank Monday you. holiday. <laughs> oh, you too. You too. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I will see you inside the Facebook groups. Thank you again thank so you much. Too. Thank you. Bye. Oh, bye. Just another reminder that I have created an extra special training for you to learn how to grow your art business quickly using murals like I have. If you're listening this summer and thinking, okay, let me see what this mural thing is all about. Or if you're wondering if you could possibly paint large scale too, then go to artistacademy.co to learn how you can start making money in the mural biz. The majority of my income comes from murals and I want to help you get started too because I know how profitable they can be. So go to artistacademy.co to claim your free training and I will see you next week. <laughs>